Thank you so much for the kind in introduction. And um, as part of the, on behalf of the Global Psoriasis Atlas, we're equally delighted to be working with the Psoriasis Association on this. So um, the work has only very recently been commissioned. So what I'm going to do in this presentation is to tell you a little bit more about the Global Psoriasis Atlas, just so you understand the work that we're undertaking as part of that program. I'm going to then move on and share with you some of the work we've undertaken taken and focused on the UK population to really understand the epidemiology of psoriasis and then end by showing how we're going to build on that with the psoriasis association work that follows. So um, first of all I'm going to talk a lot about epidemiology and I thought it'd be really helpful to just describe what epidemiology is um, at the outset. So what we're interested in when we're looking at epidemiology is really studying how often diseases occur in different groups of people and why they occur. And this information is really important because it can help us to plan and evaluate strategies to help prevent illness and diseases. But more importantly, very often, it can also be used to guide the management of patients better in whom the disease have already developed. And the Global Psoriasis Atlas was really set up in 2017 to address some of the calls for action that came out from the report on psoriasis from the World Health Organization. In particular, um, a call that focused on really improving our understanding of the epidemiology of psoriasis, in particular the incidence and prevalence at a global level, and talking about how we've got to harmonise some of our research methods to better understand this. So the Global Psoriasis Atlas um, responded directly to this. We started to identify some of those unmet needs within that report, which is now 10 years old, and think about some themes of work about how we could start to improve that. So this morning, I'm going to talk specifically about the epidemiology, but we've actually got other programmes of work that's improved on, uh, focused on improving the early diagnosis psoriasis. We've developed training resources and tools that we've piloted in the UK with non-dermatologists, and we're hoping to roll those out much further. We've got a large programme of work on comorbid disease burden. So this is other conditions associated with psoriasis. I'm going to touch on that a little bit this morning. We've also got programmes of work that's looking at the economic of impact of psoriasis on individuals themselves, but also a society at large as well. One of the big exercises that we undertake uh, every three years or so within the global psoriasis is looking at the global literature on the epidemiology of psoriasis. And this paper was published in the BMJ in 2020, was our latest um, iteration of that. And it, it's a really important piece for us because the data that was mined and what we generated from this really underpins the estimates that we present in the Global Psoriasis Atlas. But some kind of headline messages that came out from this work was that um, we're able to more accurately describe at a global level how many people are affected for psoriasis. Lots of numbers have been thrown around in the past, etc., but we think we've got a much more accurate estimate of that. What jumped out is huge variation between different countries in how often psoriasis occurs, um, which is perhaps not surprising, um, but some of the assumptions around earlier estimates assume that it occurred equally within different countries. But actually, what really jumped out more than anything is that we only had really reliable data on the epidemiology of psoriasis in one in five countries. And that was the real call for action for the Global Psoriasis Atlas about how we can, at a global level, start to improve our knowledge base. Um, I really enjoyed Russ's presentation where he emphasised very, very clearly how important it is to have the patient voice as part of this research. And this is really, really at the heart of the work that we do within the Global Psoriasis at, um, Atlas. We have um, fantastic um, individuals from across the world who contribute to our programme of work and tell us about their lived experience. And that's really important because we generate lots of data, but behind those numbers is the lived experience of individuals and how that influences and directs some of our programmes of work is really important. So the review we undertook, huge exercise, but it actually threw up lots of questions as well. It highlighted quite marked variation in the reported prevalence and incidence of psoriasis um, between countries, but also within countries, different studies have been undertaken. As we started to dig a little bit deeper into that work, we could start to see that actually there was quite a lot of methodological issues with these different studies that could explain some of that variation. 
So a variety of different data sources have often been used to look at um, the epidemiology psoriasis, which range from electronic health records, um, field studies in certain countries, um, survey work, etc. Um, several cross-sectional studies have been reported at different time points with different numbers emerging from those studies. It's really important to be very clear about actually um, what measure of prevalence we're talking about. It's not often clear sometimes in that literature about, for instance, we're we talking about lifetime ex uh, ever having psoriasis or actually is it having psoriasis at a particular point in time or a period of time. Um, but also where that assessment of psoriasis comes from. Is it a self-report from patients? Has it actually been diagnosed by the dermatologist or a physician, etc.? So lots of these things are in the mix when we start to look at this literature and try and understand some of these patterns a little bit better. But actually, what we also found is much of our knowledge comes from, not surprisingly, Western Europe and the USA. And there's far less um, data or information about how common psoriasis happens in many other parts of the world, including Asia, Africa, Eastern Europe and South America. And actually, within the data, we know very, very little about how psoriasis varies between different ethnic groups. And that's really important information, I think, as we start planning about service provision and meeting the needs of different ethnic groups. Very few studies to date have looked and focused on the incidence of psoriasis. So this is the number of new cases that appear over time. Um, we've started to kind of move that agenda forward as part of the Global Psoriasis Atlas. Um, but actually, very few studies have actually compared some key measures of the epidemiology of psoriasis, in particular, incidence, prevalence and mortality. This is really important because it helps us to answer some key questions. Firstly, whether or not the prevalence of psoriasis is actually increasing over time. If so, is this driven because more new cases of psoriasis are being picked up and detected? Or could it also be explained that people are living longer these days with psoriasis, so the number of people around in the population is increasing? We were the first ones to try and answer this question, so we're very lucky in the UK that we have a health system and we're all registered with GP practices and we can kind of look at some of that data anonymously and start to answer some of these big questions. So we did that um, about 10 years ago now in the UK and we mined this particular data set. And the figure on the, on the right really explains why it's important why we look at all these factors all together. So what we're really interested in is trying to understand the prevalence. And we can see that the prevalence is influenced by the number of new cases that come into that population of psoriasis, but it's also influenced by how, how people leave that population through mortality. And this is why we need to look at some of these figures simultaneously to try and really understand. Very few studies actually do that. They just report on the prevalence or they might just report on the incidence. And without knowing these other components, you don't know what the drivers might be within that. So we conducted um, this work and what was really interesting as we did, we looked at a 15 year period of how common psoriasis was in the UK and over that 15 year period we found that the prevalence was steadily increasing. So in the early part of that it was about 2% and at the end of the 15 years it was closer to 3%. So the prevalence had actually increased and our question is then, right, what's driving this? Is it the incidence? Is it the mortality? So how we mine this, we work with anonymised primary care data and we're very fortunate in the UK to have a system like this to help address some really important public health questions. So within this primary care data, we have detailed information about diagnoses and people, uh, treatments that people are exposed to, referrals that they may have to other parts of the health service, laboratory tests, vaccination history, and also some demographic data. So all this data is fully coded, patient identifiers are removed, and the, the niche bit here is we can link to other data sources. So for instance, we can look, link to mortality records, we can link to hospitalization records as well. So within that study, we also looked at um, new onset and when this occurred and what has been described in the literature previously is this kind of bimodal distribution. 
So early and late onset presentations for the first time of psoriasis. So we're able to characterize that across the population and show that by modal distribution, what we found, particularly for younger people, slight preponderance that this had presented much more earlier in women than men. But actually for late onset, there wasn't much difference in those particular patterns between genders. What we found actually in our analysis was that uh, our prevalence was increasing. Our incidence wasn't, it was fairly flat. So the number of new cases presenting wasn't changing year on year. But what we did was look at the mortality rate, and this was really interesting. So over that 15 year period, what I present here is comparisons of people with psoriasis in red and in, in blue is people without psoriasis and how kind of life expectancy actually improved over that 15 years for people with and without psoriasis. I think what was striking though when we looked at this data as well is actually that there is a mortality gap, that actually the mortality rate is higher in people with psoriasis and also um, that gap doesn't seem to be closing I think so that was really important. We started to look at the age bands of where that was happening and we're actually seeing that it was happening in the older ages, but people with psoriasis were dying earlier than people without psoriasis within that particular data set. So linked to that then, our next question was thinking about multimorbidity and how that may be contributing um, to some of the um, burden that people live with and potentially mortality too. So again, we mined that particular data set. We identified a cohort of adult patients with psoriasis and we match those to individuals without psoriasis on their age and on the gender and from the same general practice. So a close match coming from the same population. We looked at the prevalence of 21 comorbid um, conditions, other conditions that people may be desired, uh, uh, diagnosed with um, other than psoriasis within those records. We had a very, very large population, so we had just under 55,000 people with psoriasis that we were able to compare against um, 318,000 people without psoriasis. What we found in terms of just counts um, of, of, of comorbidities and won't be a surprise I think to many people but actually we found for no other comorbidities that was much more common in the controls without psoriasis than people with psoriasis but as we go down when we start counting the number of um, comorbidities, it was much more common in the psoriasis population, I think, coming through. What was really interesting is that we had also information on kind of socioeconomic status, and we started to make some comparisons on this slide between the most deprived and the least deprived groups, again, comparative, compared, compared with those without psoriasis. So as you can see from the top two lines, those with psoriasis had higher comorbidity in the most deprived communities. And likewise, if you look at the most affluent communities, we can also see that people matched, you know, to those without psoriasis also had higher comorbidity burdens. We also had detailed information on the age of individuals. And this I thought was particularly interesting as well, because as we started to map the comorbid burden, in that psoriasis patients compared to those without psoriasis, we could see that the onset of these comorbidities was occurring at a much younger age, I think, coming through. So some really important data to help inform where we might be targeting future interventions as we go through this. For each of the 21 comorbidities, we found higher rates in the psoriasis group, which included both physical comorbidities, but also mental health comorbidities as well. <coughs> so we've undertaken a number of studies over the last 10 years on psoriasis epidemiology, it's provided quite rich insights. And we're delighted that the Psoriasis Association have now kind of supported us to take forward the next stage of this work. So we're going to be working with the same data sets, um, very, very large population based data sets in the UK primary care records. And we're going to be linking those records to people's hospitalisation records and also mortality records from the Office of National Statistics. In recent years, we've benefited hugely as well from a new record linkage that's become available. It's the CPRD ethnicity record. So for the first time, 
we're going to be able to explore how the epidemiology of psoriasis varies between different ethnicities in the UK. At the moment, there's no data there. We have no idea what, what that looks like, and we're going to start to mine that. We're interested, because of the data, um, to look at what the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has been on the epidemiology of psoriasis. So we're helpfully now starting to extract this data set from the July 2024 build of this data. So we're able to look at what those rates were like pre-pandemic, during pandemic and post-pandemic, I think, coming through. And in particular, we're interested to see how the prevalence of psoriasis has changed. It's now 10 years since we did our last um, estimates in 2023. We'll look forward to presenting you know, updates on this over the next 12 months to the Science Association team. Um, and actually in particular, seeing if this is still being driven by either changes in incidence or mortality. So I'd like to thank um, the Science Association for supporting that work. We look forward to working with the, the association over the next 12 months. If you'd like to learn anything more about the Science Association, there's lots of information on our social media channels. But thank you very much. Just to say thank you for an incredibly interesting talk. I live with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. I remember having a conversation with my consultant 10, 15 years ago um, around a hot topic at the time, which was leaky gut. It might be called the microbiome, gut microbiome this today. <clears throat> and he said that, well, diet doesn't make that much difference because there's about... 2% population have psoriasis across the world. Well, clearly your, the, the, the research has shown that's different now. But I'm just wondering whether diet in the different countries is taken into account for those differences in variation. So that's one question. The second question is whether you looked at the incidence of um, people with psoriasis going on to develop psoriatic arthritis and whether that's different across countries. But maybe that's outside your scope. Thank you. Thank you. It's, a, it's a really um, great question, and um, yeah, that, that's something that's that's really emerged, you know, with the Psoriasis Association when we've looked at this data in detail around kind of how variation of psoriasis affects different populations. Uh, there's been big assumptions in the past that you know psoriasis affects two percent of the world population and 125 million people <laughs> off the back of an envelope are affected, but actually, when we've looked in detail at data. It is common and it's increasing in uh, many countries, for instance, what we're seeing in some of the Western European countries and in, in North Africa, sorry, in North America. But if we go into Africa and Asia and other countries, it's far less common, I think, coming through. Um, there hasn't been uh, much work that I'm aware of that's kind of in the epidemiological studies linked diets, you know, with kind of prevalence, et cetera. Um, what we have been able to do with many of our collaborators in the Global Psoriasis Atlas is look at uh, variation in ethnic groups. So we've worked with, for instance, teams um, in Malaysia very recently where we've mined their data sets and, and trying to understand how the onset of psoriasis varied between the Chinese, Malay and Indian populations in that. And it was really interesting to see how striking um, differences were emerging in how common psoriasis was in those groups um, coming through. Um, in terms of microbiome, this isn't something that we've personally looked at, so I can't kind of answer that question. Um, but I think it's a really interesting question. Um, there's lots of epidemiological data with associations with irritable bowel disease and other problems. And when we looked at comorbidities, we found that it was much more frequently in people with psoriasis than without psoriasis. But I think there's some really important questions that could be looked at in the future um, by um, possibly ourselves, but other groups too. Thank you. Um, just the question about psoriatic arthritis. Have oh. you yet yeah, that was asked? 
Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry about that bit. Um, so no, we haven't, but within these data sets, it would be possible for us to look at that quite easily, actually. So I think it's a great question, and it's something that we could probably look at, I think, in this phase of work that we take forward. So um, thank you. No, it, it's just an observation, really, that the way this piece of work started was that at one of our trustees' meetings, there was concern about whether or not our resources that we were developing were appropriate to our psoriasis community. And just for the benefit of those that are here to get today, what Helen, uh, very insightfully, as our chief executive said, is, well, we don't have that data. And we need that data in order to inform the type of educational resources and information that we provide for our members and on our website. So just for the benefit of everybody here, what we're hoping is that you'll be able to tell us a bit more about that and then we'll be able to target our materials more satisfactorily. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's, um, we're looking forward to explore this ourselves. Um, We've got the, the largest database of epidemiological studies that we've used to mine our GPA estimates, but very, very few of those studies report anything on how psoriasis varies between ethnic groups. So this is an important study that the Psoriasis Association are funding. I think it will be a bit of a benchmark about how other countries then may be able to look at their data sets uh, with a bit more granularity going forward as well. Hello there. Uh, thank you for your talk. I'm a um, clinical pharmacist working in general practice and also part of the week in a dermatology service as well. And uh, it's just a comment really that in my primary care role, I noticed that psoriasis is actually really undercoded. And I think there's a lot of education needed for clinicians in primary care. Because if they come into a clinic that I'm doing, they're often, they have a diagnosis on the primary care system of um, dry skin or eruption. It's just quite vague. It says eruption rash. And so um, the clinician, there seems to sometimes be a reluctance to nail the colours to the mast, as it were, and actually give them that diagnosis. So I suspect the prevalence is much higher and that people don't actually know they do have psoriasis, sadly. <laughs> I think that's a, a, a great um, comment um, to, to make as well. And it, it relates to other work that we've done within the Global Psoriasis Atlas as well. So with these data sources, they're very rich. Um, we actually did what's described as a case control study and, and that was published, um, you know, kind of about 18 months ago, where we looked at patients with a diagnosis of psoriasis and matched them with people without. But we looked back in the health records and looked at the kind of plotted history of kind of what they've been diagnosed with, what they've been exposed to with treatments. Um, and it was really interesting, you know, for some individuals who had a diagnosis of psoriasis, there were signs and symptoms of psoriasis in those records for occasions up to five, ten years before they actually got the psoriasis diagnosis, I think, coming through. So massive call for action there. That led us on then um, to develop a um, diagnostic tool. And during the pandemic, uh, we developed this tool and we piloted it with general practitioners, with um, pharmacists like yourselves based in general practice, and also nurses in practices. And what we found for each of those professional groups, 15 minute exercise to undertake this online um, survey. We used photographs of psoriasis and diff other differential diagnosis. We also used um, images, uh, artist images of the key characteristics of psoriasis as an educational tool. What we found is actually um, by completing that training exercise, we saw marked improvements in um, accuracy of, of detecting psoriasis, but also confidence as well within those professional groups. So one of the programmes that work within the Global Psoriasis Atlas is how we um, roll out that tool much more widely and, and evaluate the impact of that going forward as well. So thank you for the question. Thank you. Um, it's just a little bit outside the box, really. I'm going back a few years again when the, um, I'm thinking about genetics and when the psoriasis genes were, um, came about. And I'm just thinking about the prevalence. And in other countries, I'm presuming if the genes aren't there, the psoriasis won't be there. Is that right? 
And I'm just wondering if that comes into the equation because we all inherit. And if there's nobody to inherit from, you won't get so much psoriasis. Just wondered how that fitted in and if genetics still fit in psoriasis at all. A great question again, and I think the answer is, well, yes, ge genetics are probably a very important determinant, I think, as we look globally at that data. Um, but alongside genetics, I think there's a lot of environmental triggers or factors as well that, you know, play in. Um, so someone might have a genetic predisposition, but actually the interaction with some of these environmental factors, we've heard a little bit about it this morning, may also kind of make, tr make that, um, you know, kind of, pre-position to get psoriasis presents itself, I think, within the clinic. So really important. To, I think it might explain quite a bit of that variation. As we look and, and start to see cases of psoriasis in the world from some of the GPA studies we've been doing, it also presents very differently in different countries as well. You know, and it's, it's very, very different presentation on black skin than what it is on white skin, for instance. Um, and um, yeah, we, we've been able to kind of learn a lot from some of the field studies we've done in other countries as well, I think. So, yeah, thank you. Karen, thank you very much for a really interesting presentation. We look forward to hearing more.